All right, uh, today in our Sunday School lesson, we are going to be looking at the resurrection. So I got the, uh, the privilege of getting to, to go through that with you guys. Uh, if you've got your book, uh, it's uh, lesson number five, if I'm not mistaken. And if not, if you're just using your Bible, it's going to be, uh, we're going to be looking at Luke chapter 24, verses 1 through 12. And uh, this will be where, where the... Uh, uh, Jesus has been, has been put in the tomb, and uh, the ladies are coming to anoint his body, and uh, he's not there. And then the, the two angels say that he is risen. And so that's what we celebrate uh, this Resurrection Sunday. So uh, before we jump into that, let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll, we'll look at today's lesson. Father God, we want to thank you for uh, this day, uh, this Resurrection Sunday, the day that we, uh, we celebrate uh, uh, Jesus' finished work. Uh, in, in salvation, and we thank you for for his gift, and we just ask you to be with us uh, today as we look over these verses. May they be a reminder of of your love for us, and uh, also uh, of what Jesus Christ has done uh, on the cross and through his burial and resurrection. Amen. All right, so let's jump in. Uh, Luke twenty four, verses one through twelve says, but on the first day of the week at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared, and they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of Jesus. So it's the first day of the week. So this first day of the week would be uh, what Jesus proclaimed. He would, he would be buried and raised on the third day. So uh, Jesus was, was crucified on a, on a Friday uh, before, uh, before sundown. And then Saturday would have been the Jewish Sabbath. That would have been the second day. And then this, this is the third day, Sunday, uh, that the ladies are coming to anoint Jesus' body. Now, if we look up a little bit uh, into the few verses right there before it, uh, we know that the women knew where the tomb was. It says that they had, they had saw the tomb and how his body was laid, and uh, that on that Friday they went back to prepare the spices and the ointments. They would not have been able to anoint Jesus' body earlier than that because, because of the Sabbath, and uh, that would have been their day of rest, uh, the day that they uh, refrained from doing things of that way. So I know that had to be a, a very, very long day for them and the disciples, no doubt, a day that they were uh, um, mourning, uh, a day that they uh, would have been in, in great, uh, great grief and despair and thinking that uh, this man Jesus whom they've been following, who they have pledged their lives to, uh, had died and had been, had been placed in this tomb and there was nothing that they could do uh, until, that, until that Sunday. So they come early in the morning to the tomb and they had had their spices ready to, ready to prepare Jesus' body. Um, and one thing I hadn't really thought too much about, but, uh, they, as the, as the women were going there in verse two, it says they found the stone rolled away from the tomb and I hadn't thought too much about it. Um, but that had to be something that was on their mind. And as a matter of fact, or the, the stone and how, and how they were going to get that moved. And it actually, in Mark 16, in this account, it, it says that they did discuss, uh, that the stone was going to be there. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, they they had planned on going there. They were going to do what they um, what they were were going to do with anointing Jesus' body. And the fact that the stone might have been well, they were expecting the stone to be there. That was an afterthought and something that they were going to figure out once they arrived at at the tomb. And lo and behold, uh, they get there. the The stone is already rolled away. They can see inside the tomb, and when they look inside, they find out that Jesus' body is not there. And then if we look on to verse 4, it says, while they were perplexed about this, no doubt, uh, they, they knew Jesus had died on the cross. They had seen it. Uh, they had seen his body taken into the tomb. The stone was rolled, was rolled in front of it. And now they come back. Stone is rolled away and Jesus' body is gone. They are no doubt perplexed. It says, as they were standing there perplexed uh, about this, behold, two men standing by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? So the women are there. Two angels appear. And it says that uh, the women were frightened. And I thought, just thought about this today. Um, well, not this particular, but uh, anytime it seems like when 
humans here on earth, uh, in the Bible account, we, we encounter, they encounter angels. There's fear. And I just thought today, you know, there was, there was angels at Jesus's birth. There was fear. Uh, Jesus's life was lived. He was on the cross. He died. Now he's resurrected and the angels appear again to finish off this story of what Jesus has done uh, through salvation. And the, the, the ladies bow their faces to the ground in a sense of worship, uh, it seems like. But instead, the men said, why do you seek the living among the dead? Well, they're seeking uh, Jesus. They didn't uh, realize that he wasn't going to be there. Like I said, they, they uh, had already thought about how are they going to move the stone? How is that going to come into effect? And uh, none, nonetheless, they were perplexed by this. If we continue reading in verse 6, it says, He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. Let me read some verses for you to kind of uh, go back to where Jesus said that. We can look in Matthew 17, verses 22 through 23. If you want to turn there, I'll give you a, a second to get to that. Matthew 17, verses 22 through 23, uh, it says, And as they were gathering in Galilee, Jesus said to them, The Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him, and he will be raised on the third day. And they were greatly distressed. Jesus has told them uh, prior to his crucifixion what was going to happen. Uh, no doubt they did not. They still did not understand, even up to this point where the women were coming to, to anoint his body with the spices and the ointments. There was confusion, not confusion. Uh, there was a, uh, a misunderstanding, uh, a, you know, not, not a full knowledge of what Jesus was talking about when he was, when he was, uh, when he had spoken Galilee about what was going to happen. Um, I wanted to read one other thing that kind of ties in with this when it talks about his crucifixion. I want to jump back to Psalm 22. Uh, if you want to uh, go there in your Bible, Psalm 22. It is prophetic in the sense of, of what happened to Jesus on the cross. And um, I just wanted to point that out as we were going through this. So if you look at Psalm 22 in the first verse, it says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And we know that these are the words that Jesus spoke on the cross as he was being crucified. Flip over uh, to verses 12 through 18. Now, uh, think about this. This was a psalm uh, probably written by David, more than likely. Um, and uh, uh, written by David, but prophetic of what was going to happen to Jesus. Verses 12 through 18. It says, many bulls encompass me, strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me like a ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like a potsherd and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. For dogs encompass me, a company of evildoers encircle me. They have pierced my hands and feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them, and from my clothing they cast lots. Jesus knew that this was a prophecy that was going to be fulfilled by him. Uh, even speaking those words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he had already warned or already had, had, had told the women and his disciples what was going to happen, that he was going to be uh, taken uh, by man, uh, he would be killed, and then in three days rise again. And let's go back to our text. Um, da -da -da -da. All right, in verse 8, and it says, And they remembered his words. So after the angels had told, had told the ladies and reminded them about what he said at Galilee, uh, kind of the light clicked on for them, and they were like, That's right, this is exactly what Jesus said. And it's come to fulfillment. He's not here. 
uh, and returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the 11 and to all the rest. So their first reaction was uh, they want to go back and tell everybody else that Jesus is risen. He's not, he's not in the tomb anymore. He's fulfilled what he said. Uh, what he had told them in Galilee was true, that, that he would rise in three days. And so they're excited about this and going back to tell him. Um, and in verse 10, it says, now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna the Mary, oh, sorry, it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to, be, seemed to them an idle tale, and then they did not believe them. So the disciples uh, hear this news that Jesus has risen. And uh, they just, it doesn't sound believable to them. Um, it, it doesn't give the reason why they, they thought this, other than the fact, I guess, they probably saw Jesus crucified and placed in the tomb. Um, and they had not seen or, you know, had no, had no thought that Jesus would actually be able to rise uh, from the dead, uh, even though he told them that he would. Uh, could have been their, their grief and despair. They just... It, you know, had not really thought about it. Uh, even I, I imagine the the women told them about the angels and you know and, and what what the angels had told them. So the disciples' response was, after hearing this, they said, "Well, we need to go check this out ourselves. Uh, we're not just going to take your word for it. We're going to go check it out." It says, but Peter rose and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen cloths by themselves, and he went home marveling at what had happened. The disciples go and check it out. They see the proof that Jesus is not there. And they themselves go back home and, and, and wonder at what God had done, what Jesus had done. And, uh, and, and knowing that what he had told them was true. Now, this isn't necessarily a uh, new, uh, this isn't anything you've never heard before. More than likely, if you're watching this on, on, on YouTube, then this is probably not the first time that you've heard the, the resurrection uh, account. More than likely, you've, um, you've been exposed to this. Uh, it's probably one of the reasons why you're watching this is because, because you believe in Jesus Christ and, and his, his uh, crucifixion, his death, his burial, his resurrection, and you've placed your trust in, in him and the forgiveness of sins. So one of the things I wanted to do is uh, kind of follow this up with the so what. You know, we've heard this, so, so what, what does this tell us about God? It tells us that God is faithful. Um, from the Old Testament, um, he has told us a blood sacrifice is, is necessary for the forgiveness of sins. Um, he has he's told us, we looked at Psalms there, the fulfillment of Scripture. We looked at... Um, at the full, last Sunday, we looked at the fulfillment of the promise of God to David, where he said he would always have a ruler uh, from his lineage on the throne. And sure enough, Jesus is from the lineage of David, and he has a throne that lasts forever. So we know that God is faithful to his word. We know that God is faithful uh, in, in, in providing this sacrifice that he requires, and it has been fulfilled by, by Jesus uh, we also realize that God indeed loves. In John three sixteen, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, and He has provided this Son, Jesus Christ. Uh, he's provided this sacrifice through His Son, Jesus Christ, and He has fulfilled His promise that uh, that Jesus would rise again, and and that has taken place couple of things I want us to, to just kind of think about as, we, as, as we've looked at this uh, amazing story, uh, this wonderful story, a blessing, uh, to be reminded what Jesus has done. We mentioned that the women had gone, gone to the tomb knowing full well that the stone was, well, they thought that the stone was going to be there, but that, that didn't hinder them from actually going and, and doing what what they had been called to do what they were, were supposed to do in anointing Jesus' body. And as I was thinking about that, um, I just kind of came, kind of thought, you know, what, what about God? What about us? Has, is there anything that, that God has called us to do? Is there anything that, um, you know, we, we feel that, that God is compelling us to do for Him, uh, even though we've got some unanswered questions 
or we have uh, some fears, or we letting those things hinder us. The the women did not let the unanswered question about what the what about the stone hinder them from going there. Is God calling you to do something? Is He calling me to do something? Uh, and maybe we're we're letting the the question the the what about questions put a pause on those things because we want to try to figure it all out rather than just putting our faith in, and trust in God and, 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 and knowing that He's going to take care of those things. So I want to challenge you to think about that this week um, as, we, as we go through this Holy Week, as we're reminded uh, of these women and what they did. And then uh, another thing I want us to look at is, um, is the ladies that went to the tomb. One of them was Mary Magdalene, and we know that her life was transformed by, by Jesus. We know that uh, she, as soon as she found out Jesus' body was gone, she ran and let the disciples know uh, what, they, uh, what she had seen. And it made me think, you know, what about, what about us? What are, are, if you're a believer, and, uh, you know, there's a strong chance that you probably are if you're watching this, you know, God has done some. God has done a miraculous thing in your life uh, by giving you forgiveness. And are we going and telling people about what we know about Jesus? Uh, Mary Magdalene uh, ran back to the disciples and let them know uh, what had happened. Uh, that Jesus was gone, and uh, you know, are we doing the same thing? Are we are we letting people know about our transformed lives? Uh, and what Jesus has done and the good news of the, of the gospel. You know, that's one of the things that um, uh, the, 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 the men there, the disciples, they, they doubted when the ladies came and told them that the, they doubted uh, because they didn't, have any, they didn't have any proof themselves. They didn't have anything to look at themselves. And, you know, you know people may reject uh, the good news when you tell them, but they cannot necessarily... Uh, reject what Jesus has done in your life. So the question, you know, that I have is, is your life proof to them that Jesus has changed you? Is your life uh, different than it was before knowing Christ? Uh, do you do things different in, in the world that make people question, uh, you know, what is, what is this, why is this person different? Why do they act this way? Do, why do they not get mad? When they're standing in line at Walmart and somebody cuts them off uh, and, and gets in front of them, uh, you know why is this? Why is this person willing to help others when they know they're not going to get anything in return for it? Your life is a proof to people that Jesus Christ is real. And a couple, I just wanted to couple uh, cover just a few more little points here, and uh, we'll wrap up. I was reading a book. Uh, the, the case for Christ. I wanted to find some 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 evidences uh, that that we could use and we could share with other people who might doubt the resurrection. And I'm just going to share three uh, three of these uh, points that that was in this book. One of them was uh, Joseph of Arimathea had asked for Jesus's body after the crucifixion. He was a he was part of the Sanhedrin. Um, and it was the Sanhedrin. It was part. It was them that was that was part of the reason why Jesus was crucified. Even though uh, Joseph was not uh, in agreement with that, and one of the points that this book uh, made was that considering the Christians' resentment towards the Sanhedrin and what they did, it's unlikely that they would have written a positive ac account of a Sanhedrin who was willing to to take Jesus's body. And so he was using this as, uh, as a proof uh, that the account that we read in the Bible is, is proof of, of Jesus and what had happened. Uh, if, if, if they wanted to make this story seem more logical or more, you know, trustworthy or whatever, they probably, uh, your first thought was, your first thought might be, well, they're not going to include somebody who had actually helped in deciding that Jesus would be crucified. Um, but part of what makes this story true is that they, they weren't afraid to do that because it is true. They did have Joseph of Arimathea that took his body and put it in his tomb. So that was one of the, the points that they brought out. 
Another one was uh, that the women were telling of Jesus' empty tomb. Uh, during those times, the women were seen as lesser in their society. So if somebody wanted to make a, a point of proving something was true, they would have had a man tell the story. That, that would have seemed more uh, practical. But the fact that the, the gospel writers uh, truly put in the account of the women, uh, they're not trying to hide from it. Uh, the, the women, women at that time, their, their, their witness wasn't even allowed in, in court. Uh, so for the Gospels to use women as primary witnesses was a big deal. Um, the, the Gospel writers are not trying to hide from the fact that women were part of this. Uh, again, another point that, that proves to the validity of, of this account. And then uh, one more, uh, the site of Jesus' tomb was known by the Christians and the Jews. Uh, if it were not empty, it would be impossible for the Christian faith or this whole, this whole movement of, of, of Christians to be, be based on the resurrection. Um, there would have been plenty of proof if the Jewish people wanted to say, well, no, that's not what really happened. They could have written about this because they were in this city where Jesus' tomb was. Instead, uh, you find accounts of, of, of the the of, of the uh, the guards being bribed to say that they fell asleep. Well, if you're going to disprove something, you just say, no, it didn't happen. It's not, you know, it's not possible. Uh, but they didn't, they didn't do that. They, they made up other stories that made it, um, that account for the fact that there was a tomb and that it was indeed empty. And um, so again, just a, another, another a point that can help prove, you know, if somebody, if somebody's questioning you, uh, it can help prove that this gospel account of Jesus' resurrection is true. And again, if you want to read a good book on that, it's called The Case for Christ. Uh, it's by Lee Strobel. Uh, he goes through and shares uh, a bunch of uh, what we call apologetics, uh, proofs of, of what happened with Jesus. And, um, but the biggest proof that we have is our changed life and what, and what Jesus has done. Uh, in our lives. And so uh, this holy season, as we go through uh, um, the Good Friday and go through uh, S Resurrection Sunday, being reminded of what Christ has done, let's make sure that our lives are a reflection of that. And um, then people can't, can't deny the fact that Jesus has changed us and lives, the Holy Spirit lives within us and, and guides us. So let's have a word of prayer, and then uh, we, can be, we can be dismissed. Father, we want to thank you for your word. We want to thank you for uh, this time to study it. Uh, Father, we are, we are grateful that uh, you loved us enough that you would send your Son as a sacrifice for our sins. Father, may we never take it for granted. May we not forget it. May it be a time that uh, we are, are giving you praise for what you've done. And we ask these things in your son's name. Amen.